Good evening, everyone. My name is Dan Stokes, and I'm the Chief Administrative Officer at First Book. And I'm very excited to welcome you here this evening to the conversation around diverse and banned books and their impact in the classroom. Thank you so much for joining us. We are thrilled to share the results from our diverse book impact study and our banned book survey. We are also going to hear from three educators about what makes these topics so important to them. I'm joined by Julianne Appleton, our Director of Research and Insights at First Book, who will be reviewing the results of these research studies, and Jenna Greenspan, our Head of Member Marketing and Engagement, who will be leading the conversation with our educators, Josie Silva, Awanya Urquhart, and George Marie Jasmine. But before we jump into the content, I wanted to give everyone a reminder of what First Book is and what we're focused on. First Book's mission is to further educational equity. Over our 32 year history, we have built an ecosystem of programs driven by the First Book Network. Our community of more than 575,000 educators. This includes formal and informal educators working with children ages zero to 18, in under-resourced communities. These formal and informal educators and organizational partners like you are at the heart of First Book. Our work starts with our research arm, First Book Research and Insights. We conduct as many as 30 studies annually through focus groups to large-scale surveys. Educator insights inform our work and increasingly guide academic experts companies, and the social sector. Studies like the one you'll hear about today are elevating educator voices into the national and regional dialogues on critical issues. Our second program is our nonprofit e-commerce site, the First Book Marketplace. It provides educators with access to the books and resources they need for free and at the lowest possible prices. Through the marketplace, we get 15 million books into the hands of kids and educators annually. The third is the First Book Accelerator. It provides our community of educators with access to the strategies of leading experts on a wide range of issues, such as how to create literacy-rich environments and how to support young people as change makers. By bringing together the collective knowledge, insight, and market leverage of hundreds of thousands of educators, First Book can create a powerful market lever for change. And we're delighted that you decided to join us for our conversation tonight. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Jules to talk about our studies. Thank you, Dan. And thank you everyone for joining tonight. So as Dan said, my name is Jules Appleton. I am Director of Research and Insights at First Book. And today I'm going to be walking through the findings from First Book's Diverse Books Impact Study and Banned Books Survey. So these are two separate studies, but their subject matter does overlap significantly. So while we all understand that diverse books and banned books are not synonymous, we also know they aren't unrelated. So we're presenting these findings together so that you can get the most comprehensive picture of some of the challenges that educators just like yourself are facing right now when it comes to inspiring young readers. So we're going to start with the Diverse Books Impact Study today. And our Diverse Books Impact Study was a roughly six month longitudinal study that examined how educators build and curate diverse classroom libraries and how those diverse classroom libraries impact students and teachers. This was First Book's very first longitudinal intervention based study, which just means that data was collected over time and we were tracking the impact of a specific action, that action being the infusion of diverse books into the classroom. So we really hope that this is just the beginning of First Book producing some much needed true impact data for the field. And we'll talk a little bit more about the need for that data in a few slides. So I'm going to review key findings first to really just give you an idea of the main takeaways from this study so that you can keep these finding in, findings in mind as we move through the detailed data. So we learned from the study that students' reading scores increased after educators added diverse books to their classroom libraries. 
We learned that bilingual and LGBTQ plus titles drove the largest reading gains. We saw that students spent more time reading after educators added diverse books to their classroom library. So beyond just reading scores, reading engagement also improved. We saw that allowing students to choose which books they want to read positively affects outcomes. And a majority of students choose to read diverse books that serve as mirrors where they can see themselves. So let me set the scene for you. What set First Look out to conduct this study? The information on the slide is probably not new or shocking information to this group here, but I do think it's important to review just for context as we set up this study. So problem number one, the lack of access to books in low-income communities. First Look has always known that access to books for kids in low-income communities is limited. A study by early literacy researcher Susan Newman found that in the lowest income neighborhoods, there is often only one book for every 295 children. This is compared to more affluent communities where there is typically one book for every five children. So access to any books at all is often the number one priority for educators. But if you want to get kids excited about reading, you really need more than just any book. So what kind of books do educators need? This brings us to problem number two, the lack of diversity in children's books. So existing research has taught us all that diverse characters and cultures are often not represented in children's books, even though 53% of school-age children are children of color. A 2022 review of nearly 3,500 children's titles revealed that the diversity represented in children's books does not reflect the diversity of readers. One of our first First Book Network surveys taught us that 90% of First Book members said their students would be more enthusiastic readers if they had access to books with characters, stories, and images that reflected their lives. So in response to findings like these and ongoing research and endless anecdotal feedback from educators about the importance of diverse books, First Book has been intentionally curating titles with diverse characters and cultures for the First Book marketplace for years and years. In 2022 alone, First Book members purchased over 2.5 million diverse books from the First Book marketplace. So we know these books are in high demand, but how do we know if these books are actually making a difference in kids' lives? And what difference are they making? So data on the lack of and need for diverse children's books is pretty well documented, but data on the impact of having access to those diverse books is not. And that's how the Diverse Books Impact Study was born. So this study was designed with three objectives in mind. Objective one, to better understand the impact of diverse classroom libraries from the educator perspective. Objective two, to better understand the impact of diverse classroom libraries with respect to student outcomes. And objective three, to add to the limited existing research on this topic. So I want to take a moment to speak specifically to objective number three. As I mentioned before, there is existing research that links diverse books to student choice and reading engagement. And there's some research that demonstrates that access to diverse books in the classroom and at home results in greater self-confidence and empathy and cultural awareness for children. However, this research is often conducted within a single classroom or with a very controlled sample size. First Book wants to start filling this gap in existing research for the education sector by leveraging the voices of our network of 575,000 educators and their experiences. So that's all of you guys. Can First Book become a go-to source for providing quality data on the impact of diverse books for the field? This is an overview of our study methodology. So just know that the study was conducted in two phases. Phase one was our large scale quantitative surveys. We essentially started by sending a screener to the entire First Book Network to gauge interest in participating in the study. We told everyone they'd be required to place a fully funded order of $250 worth of diverse books from the First Book Marketplace, and then answer a series of brief surveys in the months following. Nearly 4,000 educators filled out the screener to participate in the study. So clearly there was exceptional interest to participate. In the end, we had 437 educators complete the study. Phase two involved qualitative interviews and nearly all of our participants raised their hand to say, yes, I would love to participate in an interview also. 
In the end, we conducted 15 informal semi-structured interviews. So with that, let's see what changes occurred when educators added $250 worth of diverse books, which ended up being approximately 50 books per participant to their classrooms. First, we wanted to establish some baseline measurements to help us understand how students interact with their teachers' current classroom libraries. So through a five-point agreement scale, we learned that students are generally engaged in reading, but most excited to read books that reflect who they are. You can see 78% of educators said that their students were interested and enthusiastic about reading at the start of the study, with 70% indicating that their students more often choose books that serve as mirrors, compared to 41% who say their students more often choose books that serve as windows. And you can see to the right in the gold box that we use the Bishop definitions of windows and mirrors. Windows are books that allow students to see into the lives of others, and mirrors are books that allow students to see their lives reflected back at them. The very first promising key finding to come from the study was that just five months after the infusion of diverse books into the classroom, the average amount of classroom reading time increased by four hours per week. So this means the addition of approximately 48 books through this study added four hours of collective reading each week to the classroom. And beyond just reading engagement, reading scores also improved for our participants. So at each bi-monthly survey time point, educators reported gains in reading assessment scores. And you can see that reflected in this chart to the right here. Now, of course, this would be expected in any classroom that scores improve regardless of an infusion of books. What's interesting is that the amount scores improved in this study was far higher than the nationally expected yearly gains. So the NCES, the National Center for Education Statistics, reports an average gain of six points in reading scores for a given year. Our participants saw gains of nine points by the end of the study, so three points higher than the national average. And even more exciting, the gains were greatest for the lowest scoring students. So those students who stood to improve the most did. Next, we learned that two specific types of diverse titles drive even greater engagement and growth than others. Bilingual books had a significant impact on reading scores. For every one additional bilingual book that participants added to their libraries, their students' reading assessment scores improved by seven points on average. Additionally, for every one LGBTQ plus book that educators added to their libraries, students' scores improved by 4.5 points on average. And this was regardless of classroom makeup. So we did not ask educators to report on whether their students were part of the LGBT community. We saw these gains regardless. So this really helps us understand that there is a notable difference between giving students just any new book and giving them books that reflect their lived experiences. So now we're gonna to pivot to discuss the findings from our banned books survey. And the topic of banned books was addressed in a separate study because as I mentioned earlier, diverse books and banned books are not synonymous, but there is significant overlap. Another important note on this survey before I dive in was that we very specifically asked educators about their feelings and experiences with the national dialogue around banned books. So this survey was not focused on what happens when educators are forced to remove books from their classroom libraries, but it was more focused on how this current very public dialogue around banned books is impacting teachers, students, and education in general. So with that, let's take a look at what we learned. I'll start with the key findings again. So the main findings from this survey, one third of educators in the First Book Network said they are facing book bans, challenges, or policy restrictions. However, nearly all educators believe books should rarely or never be banned. We learned that educators feel undermined, disrespected, and distrusted to do their jobs, and that a lot of teachers are scared for the future of education and sometimes even for themselves. We saw that educators are again feeling the effects of being left out of a critical national education conversation when in fact they are the trained professionals in this space, and we see this sentiment come up a lot in our research. And lastly, we learned that some educators lean in and buy more banned books in response to this public conversation, 
while others stop buying books altogether for fear of wasting their money if the books end up being banned or removed. This is a quick look at the methodology for the study. Um, the survey went out in April of this year and we received over 1500 completed survey responses. It was a one-time survey. It was not a longitudinal study like the impact study. So first things first, we wanted to get a feel for what kinds of book restrictions, if any, our educators are currently facing. We saw 40% of first book members are not facing any book restrictions. You can see 29% were unsure or reported a unique situation that didn't quite fit one of the answer options. And 31% said, yes, there have been book bans, challenges, or restrictions in my school. So for those one third of educators who are facing book restrictions, you can turn your attention to the chart on the right to see the breakdown of what those restrictions are. So 18% say specific titles have been challenged but not banned. 10% say their school has policies about themes of books that aren't allowed, and 11% are at schools where specific titles have in fact been banned. All right, so the next three slides tell a bit of a combined story, so hang on with me through these three slides. First, we wanted to know if our educators had already removed any books from their personal library, either because they were worried they might be challenged or banned or incite backlash, or because they were in fact banned. And you can see here that largely the answer is no. Over 70% of educators say they have not removed any books from their classroom library in response to this dialogue around banned books. However, that doesn't mean that the public attention on banned books right now isn't affecting teaching. So while educators for the most part are not removing books from their libraries, many are changing the way they shop for books and teach. So 46% of educators in the survey reported that the conversation around banned books already does or might influence the titles they choose for their class. And 37% report that the conversation around banned books already does or might influence the way they teach. So we're seeing that this conversation is having a chilling effect on educators beyond just the districts that are seeing the book bans. So we're gonna dig a little deeper into what some of those changes are. But before we jump into those changes in educator behavior, I'm gonna pause and explain the layout of the upcoming slides. So on the next few slides, we're going to be reviewing qualitative data that came in through open-ended responses. So you'll see responses grouped by theme, showing the most prevalent common themes to come out of a response set. The numbers in the bubbles represent the percent of responses to a question that touched on each theme. Responses may touch on multiple themes, therefore these percents are not going to add up to 100. So for all the educators who said that they are or might change their teaching in response to the public attention on banned books, we wanted to ask how and why. In what ways have educators changed their classroom library, their shopping behaviors, or teaching in response to the dialogue around banned books? The major themes that came from responses to this question include First and foremost, some educators are buying fewer books, distributing books less often or under more controlled circumstances and being more selective in the titles they purchase for their classroom. So educators are really looking to protect themselves. And this theme represents about 77% of responses. You can see some powerful quotes here that demonstrate this finding. Educators saying, I no longer purchase books that have been banned or challenged because I worry I am wasting my money. The next major theme to come from this question is that some educators are leaning in and buying more banned books. And most commonly, educators said they lean in and buy more man banned books because they don't ever want to restrict access to information for students. They don't want any students to feel unseen or unimportant. Or quite simply, they know that the books their students want to read are the more likely to be challenged ones. So you can see some more key supporting quotes here. This educator says, because of books being banned, I have gone out of my way to have controversial books available in my classroom. If I can make even one child feel more comfortable or seen, then it's all worth it. I'm gonna pause once more and just take a quick detour here. So you might wonder how both these things can be true. How can 77% of responses talk about being more selective in their book purchasing and the access that they provide their students? and 48% of responses touched on being more um, limited with banned books and ensuring greater access to challenged content. So in what situations might these two things overlap where educators are both being more 
um, restrictive with their access and also leaning in and providing greater access. The most common example was that educators are being more selective in what they make openly accessible in the classroom versus what is available under controlled access. So some educators are still buying the books that they know will be most impactful for their students, regardless of whether the content has been challenged or banned. But they are also keeping certain titles under their control to distribute. So the most common reason for this was that educators want to always remain respectful of families' requests when it comes to what their children can have access to, but that doesn't mean that they remove controversial books altogether. They are selective in which students get access to which titles. Another common overlap situation here is just educators who serve all ages, right? And they might be more selective in the access that they provide younger students, but less selective in the access that they provide older students. Our third major theme to come from this question, we saw about 44% of responses spoke about empowering students with knowledge, free choice, and open conversation about banned books. So educators are using this moment in time to educate and empower students. Some educators even turned it into a lesson like this educator that's represented in the green box here. Lastly, we saw about 25% of our educators say that because of this national dialogue around banned books, they're simply adhering to the restrictions in place for fear of jeopardizing their jobs. So this educator says, I censor in a way I don't believe in based on fear of my upper administration. So we know on the individual educator level how the banned books conversation can impact their work, but let's zoom out. How do first book members see book banning impacting their teaching in the grand scheme of things, regardless of whether they have changed their teaching practices or not? So this was another open-ended question. We did intentionally lean heavily on open-ended qualitative data in this survey to really allow educators the freedom to speak on this topic in their own words, instead of having to try and fit your thoughts on such a complex topic into predetermined responses. So we very intentionally asked a lot of open-ended questions in this survey. So from this question, how does book banning impact teaching, whether negatively or positively? We learned, number one, educators feel like their expertise is being undermined and they are not trusted to do the jobs that they are so passionate about and have worked so hard to be experts at. So this one educator says, banning books negatively impacts my teaching because it limits instruction, learning, and inquiry. Another educator says this impact is more psychological, having a muzzling effect. No one wants to be the first person targeted. Second major finding, educators believe banning books erases people and history. Representation matters and book banning devalues it. So you can see some great quotes here. One educator says, banning books attempts to delete history and people. I would never want to hide reality from my students. Third, banning books discourages critical thinking and students should feel empowered to learn. So this person says, the banning of books tells students they cannot be trusted with information. And lastly, number four, a smaller percent of responses suggested that book banning isn't always bad. And this was largely related to younger students where teachers felt that certain topics like sexuality and violence were not necessary or appropriate for younger ages and could be more distracting than educational. All right, we're winding down just a few more slides here. Um, another question we wanted to ask educators and allow for free response to, have you observed any noteworthy changes in student engagement or learning, either positive or negative, in relation to banned or challenged books? And what we learned was students are reading more when given access to banned books and free choice reading. So this response was about 78% of our audience. And this qualitative finding is really key because it touches on the powerful combination of student choice and access to titles with diverse representation. So it's not one or the other. It's knowing that students will be more excited if they get control over what they read. And as we saw in our diverse book study, what they want to read is the diverse books that feature characters and storylines that reflect their own realities. And we also know that students become more intrigued in something when they are told they can't know about it. So these banned books become really appealing. This educator says, my students actively seek out books that have been challenged in other places. They know people are banning the good stuff. The second common theme is along the same lines. Many educators pointed out that restricting book access in any way at all only limits student reading engagement. 
So you can see this educator at the bottom says, not having access to banned books means only less engaging books are available. And lastly, a smaller but notable percentage of educators pointed out that the family opinion impacts a student's learning journey. So this educator represented here tells a story of a child who is not allowed to join the class in the library because there are LGBTQ books available. But the educator pointed out that this child isn't just being shielded from the content in those specific titles, but is also being shielded from other learning opportunities like developing research skills, identifying credible sources, the poetry unit, and really just being able to check out books and enjoy the library. So we always like to ask our educators at the end of any survey, is there anything else we should know? We like to give them the space to leave feedback related to the survey topic that they think first book should know as we continue to try to support them in this space. So four major themes emerge from educators' final thoughts on the topic of banned books. Number one, educators want to make clear that the conversation around banned books and the resulting restrictions harm students first and foremost. Banning books, particularly the books currently being banned, hinders student learning and especially harms minority groups. This educator says when we ban books, we're not only removing diversity and representation, we are telling key groups of kids that they are not worthy of being represented, that they don't matter, that they are invisible. Number two, educators also wanna make clear that this conversation and the resulting book restrictions harm educators themselves as well. So the current national dialogue around banned books discredits educators and instills fear. This educator says this conversation is causing animosity toward the profession. People don't want to become teachers. Third finding, educators also want to remind us that banned books can, do, and should empower students. Knowledge is power and students of all ages can benefit from being exposed to diverse content. This educator says books encourage and promote independent and critical thinking, which empowers leaders and change. We are stifling children and limiting future leaders with these restrictive book bans. And lastly, approximately 40% of responses touched on, again, the importance of the family role in all of this, mainly that families can have final say over what their own children learn and read, but they cannot control what others consume. So as you can see, we learned a lot and saw some really promising results because of this work. $250 worth of diverse books can make a huge difference in student outcomes. And educators are determined to not let the conversation around banned books impact their students' love of reading. So we're clearly very excited and eager to get these results out into the field. You can see we have a few more webinars just like this one to present the results, but we're also starting to look towards future research. So first book is looking to continue this work, mainly repeating the diverse books impact study for a full school year and including more educators in the study. We did face several study limitations that we would ideally address in future phases of that study to really just further validate and expand upon all the findings you saw today. And as I mentioned before, future study phases would also be part of an ongoing effort to add much needed data on the impact of diverse books to the field. Data that simply doesn't exist at the scale that First Book can execute. And lastly, First Book Research and Insights will continue to conduct research among our educators in low-income communities to identify the challenges they face, help them overcome those challenges where we can, and share their stories far and wide to raise awareness and support for these educators and the children they serve. So that's all of you here today. And with that, I'm going to turn it to Jenna and our panel of educators to talk more about these important topics. Thank you so much, Jules. I really appreciate you walking through all of that uh, with us. And I'm really excited for all of us to be able to hear from the participants in the study themselves, our very special guests today, three First Book member educators. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your experience with um, this study with us, your experiences in your classrooms, and sharing your wisdom, your your challenges, your best practices with all of your peers this evening. So we appreciate you being here. 
Um, I wanted to start out by asking, let's start with you, Josie, if you don't mind. Um, and if you could tell us, just to remind us again, where you teach and what age students you work with. Um, yeah, so hi, my name is Josie Silver. I am a Montessori teacher in Detroit Public Schools um, and I teach first through third graders. And Josie, why is it important to you to provide access to diverse titles in your classroom? Yeah, so in Detroit, especially, and I think this is a, a growing problem across the country, like my district of 50,000 um, has one certified librarian. So that means that basically no schools have school libraries, including my own. So for me, if my students don't have access to diverse texts within my library, that just means they don't have access, period. There's really no other um, access point for many of them. So I know that having these titles um, is, is critically important. Thank you for being that source for them. Um, Hawanya, I would love to hear again, remind us where you teach and the age of students you serve, and then why are diverse, uh, why is access to diverse titles important to you as an educator? So I am Hawanya Urquhart. I teach for Plymouth Canton Schools at Liberty Middle School in Canton. I work with eighth grade students um, and it's important. I have a diverse student body that I work with. And I think it's important that each of my students can refer to a book. I have a book with a character that looks like them. So that's my intention. My I'm intentional about what I have um, in making sure that all of my students are seen um, in the literature that they read. And I believe you're fortunate at your school that you do have a school library and a media center that you work with closely. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've how you've worked with the librarian in that media center? to bring so that to the culture of your school? Right, sure. We definitely team, <laughs> tag team a lot with getting the books and titles that we use. So for instance, I have a book tasting at the start of every year. And so whatever I tell her kind of like what my focus is, so she'll put in her stack of you know suggestions and I'll bring mine and it's usually you know it works well together. So we definitely have conversations, a lot of conversations. And, and planning and what we execute and deliver to kids. Mm -hmm. And then George Marie, please say hello. Tell us where you teach and what age kids you're serving. Good evening, my name is George Marie Jasmine and I work for the Boston Public Schools. My school is called the Ellison Parks Early Education School and it's located in Mattapan, Massachusetts. I work with kindergartners, so five and six year olds. Um, these books, having the, the availability of these books to my students is ever so important because the majority of my students, um, English is not their first language. So mm -hmm. they need themselves, their cultures, their identities, their religions reflected. They need to see those mirrors in the books that uh, are in the classroom. Uh, we're lucky to have a library in our school and also to be within walking distance of a gorgeous library in uh, our community of, of Mattapan. So I'm glad to have the opportunity to um, expose my students to books and also share my love of reading with them as well. That is very fortunate. They're lucky to have you. Um, George Marie, let's stay with you for a minute, especially because you mentioned the public library. What are some ways that you've successfully built a diverse classroom library and how are you, you leveraging that public library to have that love of reading available to your students everywhere they are. Um, the first thing that I wanna say is I'm very grateful to First Book because uh, First Book has allowed me to make a lot more books available to my students. I purchased um, many books that I've given to them um, usually during the holiday time and in June to give them their own books so they could have a set of books for during uh, the holiday break and during the summer and to bring that interest to them. I also spend a lot of money on books, uh, particularly books that are bilingual books. Uh, the students in my class uh, room speak an at home uh, languages. They speak Yoruba, they speak Spanish, they speak French and Haitian Creole. Wow. So I've tried to find all of those books to place in the classroom so they can see themselves. Um, I uh, started school as, uh, English was not my first language. 
So um, when I see that in my students, I also see myself. And I did not have the opportunity to have all those books at school. My parents made those available at home, but at school, um, there were not bilingual books. Mm -hmm. So um, the opportunity to give that to my students and to see their interests when they open the book and they see, wait a minute, one side is English and the other side is French. It really opens for them and says, wow, somebody's interested in, in the language that I speak. And um, mm -hmm. a lot of them are very grateful for that opportunity and they've shared that with me. That's wonderful. Hwanya, you are working with older students. So how do you think about building a successful, diverse classroom library? And how do you involve the kids that you serve in that process? So I often, I, I listen to the kids. So I listen to conversations. I, I you know, I, I call it ear hustle. So I, I listen to their conversations. <laughs> I'm watching, you know, like what's on social media as well. Just kind of, just if I can figure out what they like, then I, I can tie that to a book that's, you know, been published or is going to be published, then that's what I'm looking for. Um, I do have conversations with young people. I have an elective class where um, I've taught social justice through literature. So just listening to what they're interested in and what their wants are, I think that's very important. So I take that information and then I start looking for books. Um, and then I just, I have different authors that I follow and that I've used. And then those titles, if they're not familiar with them or those authors, I present those to do a lot of book talking um, mm -hmm. um, with people, but definitely listening to them and hearing what their interests are and then taking that and applying to the purchases that I make. That's excellent. Josie, what kind of tips and tricks might you have for another elementary educator on how to build a diverse classroom library given that you are the only source in, in the school for, for your kiddos to have access to this? Um, yeah, so I think similar to what um, the others have said, like First Book has totally transformed my classroom library. A few years ago, I worked in a mainly bilingual school and then I shifted and now most of my students, English is their first language, but it's still like, you know, 90% students of color. So like still need for diverse books, but maybe not as many for the bilingual ones. Um, mm -hmm. But I found that like, I once I was able to start using first book and use specifically like the curated sections, I think that's something that when I talk to others, we see as one of the, the most positive things that a first book offers is like these really specific sections. It's not just like fantasy, it's like grief or social emotional learning or something so that you can really target like exactly what you're looking for. You know, maybe you have a keyword in your mind like mindfulness, but there's usually um, really good subcategories. And so I do see first book as the place that I send everyone or all my friends, anybody who's a teacher, I'm always telling them like, have you started, have you done first book before? Because I, I do think that the, the curated aspect is one of its biggest, um, one of the biggest positive things as well as obviously having lower cost affordable options. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I will tell our curation team that you said so. That is not what I do at First Book, but I will let them know that it's useful. And I think what's great about it too is that any educator, whether they're a First Book member or not, can see the site and how it's organized and uh, title suggestions under those different types of categories. So I'm proud that we're a resource for any educator, whether they're a member of the network or not. So I appreciate that. Uh, let's talk about challenges for a moment. I know a few of you have already touched on lack of other community or school resources. I think finances is probably a big one. Um, George Marie, what challenges have you faced when trying to build a diverse classroom library? Um, some of the challenges, as you say, are, are financial, uh, but I must say that our district has been extremely supportive in making sure that our students and families have access to books. Last month, there was a back to school fair where over 40,000 books were made available to students wow. and families in the district. And um, I strongly suspect that most of those books might have come from First Book. So um, that, that's, that's one opportunity that we have. Um, we 
also make sure in, in my school that as soon as you walk in, one of the first things you see is um, our books. Our books mm -hmm. to for students to have that opportunity to see it right in front of them and to instill that love of learning. Um, so challenges, I find the challenges are finding those bilingual books. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely it's easy to find bilingual books in English and Spanish. Um, it takes me a little bit of time to find uh, books in French and English and Haitian Creole and English. I uh, am still looking to find a book in English and Yoruba. So um, those are some of the challenges, but I think that um, generally I've been able to find books. Yeah. So yeah, I, I would say that the challenges are, are not many, but they're, they're, they exist. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, you're you're doing a beautiful job addressing them, overcoming it. Um, Josie, what about you? Are there challenges outside of financial challenges that have made it difficult for you to have the type of diversity in your library that you that you hope for? Um, I do want to say that I recently I was thinking and looking at my classroom library and being like, man. Like, what did I even have before first book? <laughs> because so many of them are, and I did add it. I, I looked through all my past orders and I've gotten like $2,000 worth of books from first book in the past two years. So just saying that is for like, when I added it up, I was like, oh my gosh, like, I guess I didn't really have books prior to this. Um, I did. That's but not, not why we invited you here tonight. I promise. Yeah. Didn't pick <laughs> no, no, but I, I added it up because I was curious. Um, so for me, I think one of the things that I'm really working on and first book has been a part of this is that like my my school is trying to create recreate a school community library, maybe without a librarian, but like I just feel like one of my my classroom has so much access and there are certainly others who do within the school as well, but it's on a lot of tiny scales. And so mm -hmm. for me, I really feel this desire to like make sure that we know everyone in the school has equal access and so finding and creating those systems has been a challenge um, when you are working from the ground up when libraries have been um, fundamentally eliminated getting the getting the access systemically throughout the building and and beyond mm -hmm. i want to talk a little bit now about your students themselves. And Jules shared some great data, both about the academic benefits that we found through the study when students had access to these types of titles, and also some other more qualitative observations that educators were sharing with us. So, Hawanya, let's start with you. I, I, maybe this is um, unfair, but middle schoolers could be a bit of a tough crowd sometimes as readers. Okay. So what kinds of um, changes have you seen in your students when they have access to this type of material? Um, what have you seen their reactions to be? Right. So there's always, I don't like to read. I'm not a reader. And that's my challenge. I take that on, you know, I take it personal. And that's my goal to find that book for you. And if it's a book that you see a character that um, looks like them or just a character that they can connect with, that's definitely been a positive, not a positive, but it's, I mean, yeah, it is positive, but I've seen kids say, how do you know to find the book that's right for me? And because I found, you know, like they've read, I don't know if we're supposed to say titles or not, but the poet X, the, you know, like when she's like, that's me. Like, how did you know that was me? And I said, I just, I don't know, but you know, I'm able to connect kids with what um, eventually becomes of interest. So just getting them, it's a win when you have that resistant reader at the beginning of the school year. And then a month later, because I start with an independent reading unit to start the school year. And mm -hmm. after those six or seven weeks, you know, a parent is emailing me saying, thank you. You know, like you, you got my kid to read a whole book. So that's, you know, that's it. But middle school, yes, they're challenging. But if you're at it, you know, you just keep listening and finding out their interest in their, um, we'll get some going. So that's, that's been, it's worked for me. 
in my hand. You all are so. extraordinary in the level of personalization and just how much you yeah. care. It's it's yeah. it's spectacular. You have Thank to have you. those. If you don't have those relationships and that rapport, then of course it's not going to be successful. But it, it's worked. Mm -hmm. Josie, how about you? What have you seen your students' reactions be to having more access to this type of material? Um, I know you. some of you have talked about maybe um, more windows being uh, the game changer versus mirrors in stories. Which have you seen um, resonate most with your kids? Yeah, I mean, I think I've seen, you know, a, a bit of both, um, especially at this lower level. And I'm sure George Maurice is the same thing. When you read a text and you put it on display where they can then go read it, it's like a race to see who can grab it first to check it out or something like that. Um, but then what's been so nice is, you know, I think this study and just like the diverse books kind of movement in general has really expanded my mind and kind of my critical eye of what I'm looking at in my own um collection and so i have a student with alopecia and i don't know if before i would have thought like oh i need to have a, a book on alopecia and so i got a couple and other students have read it a lot and that student was like oh that's me in the story and so i think students have been able to both share with their families connect with one another and like really feel seen in like a much deeper and more specific way that would never have been possible with my classroom library like a few years ago mm -hmm. Thank you. And George Marie, what about you? So our library area is the biggest area in our entire classroom. And um, it's funny because I often hear the students, they come over to me and they're like, can I go read a book? And I always have to do a double take when they say that because <laughs> I'm like, oh. usually they want to play with Legos or play with something. But they're like, I want to read a book. Oh. And uh, Hawaii Hawani was talking about ear hustling. I've done that a lot. And um, on two occasions, kids have been sitting side by side and they're like, oh, they point to a character in the book and they say, oh, he looks like me. He looks like me. Or she has hair like me. Or um, she has, I, my sister looks like her. Or my family is just like that. And just that identification is, it's such a good feeling to hear that as a teacher knowing that they see themselves and knowing that that encourage them, encourages them to want to, to read more and to look at books and, um, you know, to build that curiosity and to build that understanding. Okay. How wonderful. To, oh, that's the kind of ear hustle we like. I also love that <laughs> phrase. I didn't know it before tonight, but now it's in my vocabulary. Um, and I was going to let you guys off the hook with that question, but Josie said something that really resonated with me um, in her last response about something that um, she thought about differently as an educator, watching her students respond to this. So I wonder um, if maybe, uh, Juanya, you could answer that too. Is there anything about yourself as an educator that you've seen changed or you had an aha moment as you've been able to add more of this great content to your library or watch your students interact with it? For me, I think it, I've become more intentional in what I share. Like I, I work with a lot of young people that don't look like me. And I think it's important that they are not held within a bubble. So they need to learn how using these different books to, to help them navigate through life in the world. Like, so they're not in this bubble. So they're being exposed to, um, others right and learning and you we learn a lot from what we read right mm -hmm. and so I, I think it's my purpose now to just kind of help you know just expose kids to a little bit of everything and and, and letting them know what the world looks like and it doesn't always look like what they look like and just being able to you know go from there i'm sorry right, you hear that. before <laughs> we're live from real schools all around the country right, right. Now. <laughs> um, George, Mary, if you would answer, if you have any aha moments for yourself as an educator, and then I would love to um, bring Jules back after that and uh, take some questions that we've been getting from the chat from your fellow educators here tonight. So George, Mary, take us home on this one, and then we'll um, go to some questions from the Q&A. My aha moment is learning about other cultures and customs. Um, I've had the opportunity to learn more about um, Ramadan 
um, the Chinese New Year and exposing my students to that about other cultures that are different from their own and to see those different celebrations. Um, I think there's a tendency sometimes to focus on, oh, these are the, this is what other cultures eat and things like that. But mm -hmm. I want to talk mm -hmm. about what are the traditions, what are the other things that are being done in cultures that um, when students see it can say, oh, we do the same thing. You know, so we're just like this family. We may look different, but we do the same thing. And finding that commonality is extremely important. And um, that's something that's been a, a big aha moment for me, just to continue to emphasize that with my students. Fantastic. All right, Jules is coming back in in case there are some questions about the research itself, which I will absolutely defer to her on and not try to answer on my own. Um, but you all have been fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see. First, we have a question about, um, oh, this is, this I think um, is great. It's a question from Bradley. They teach at a rural school and they have a small population of Hispanic and Latin A students. And so they're asking for some good suggestions for books to make them feel included in their school. So I, again, am not our title curator for the First Book Marketplace, but I do have a favorite section I can point you to, Bradley, which is called Welcoming Schools and Communities, which again, as Josie was saying, you probably won't find on any other site um, presented in just that specific way. But if you're on the First Book Marketplace and you go to books and then diversity and inclusion on that page, there's a whole section called Welcoming Schools and Communities. There's also one called Connecting Food and Culture that uh, George Marie just made me think of, which might be a great place to find some of those uh, different cultural observances and um, especially connected to food. So that might be a fun one to check out as well. Um, George Marie, do you have any other, will you help me answer this too? Are there other favorite books or strategies that you have for your English language learners or if you have um, new immigrant families to make them feel welcome? Um, I find that that curated section is really important. Um, a lot of times the books, I will find them in English and then I will definitely find them in Spanish. I'm thinking of like three books in particular that I was a, I have them in my class. I have the English on one side and the Spanish on the other side. And the students, mm -hmm. whether they speak uh, Spanish or not, like to put them side by side and, and compare, you know, the words. So I think First Book really has a great selection. Um, your local library is, is, is another great place to go. Um, the librarians are valuable resources to, to talk about what books do you have for other cultures? And um, I don't know if that you have access to that in your community, but that local library is ever so important. Thank you so much. Um, speaking of librarians, Jules, this one is for you about the participants in this study. Did we have classroom teachers only or were there school librarians or other types of educators who participated? So the Diverse Books Impact Study was classroom-based teachers specifically, and um, ideally in the future we would expand upon that. And then the Banned Books Study, yes, it did include um, some librarians. and. You know, you can go on firstbook.org to see the full report and see all the details of the demographics of people that did answer these surveys. But yeah, it was largely classroom based. Thank you very much. Can I stay with you for one more? Um, this yeah. question is from Caleb about, and I think this is specifically about the banned book study and the impact on educators. Uh, he's wondering about if the impact was different or if even um, anecdotally you saw different information coming in from educators serving older students versus younger kids. So did we look at that data through a lens of, you know, whether you're serving elementary or middle school or high school students at all? Yes, we did look at the data through um, the lens of all different ages served. Um, for both of these studies, banned books in particular, uh, we did have more elementary and middle school participants than anything else, but that just tends to be the makeup of the first book network. So we leaned heavily in elementary and middle school space, but 
among the few younger early childhood um, participants that we had, there really wasn't much of a difference in findings, which was really interesting to us. So all the gains were pretty much the same. Um, a lot of the qualitative feedback that we've heard is how important it is to provide students at really early ages access to these diverse books because forming your identity, your racial identity, is it starts happening really early and it's super critical to have access to these books at all ages. So that is something that we definitely want to expand upon in future research. I feel like you're teeing me up perfectly to say this every time. So <laughs> we, we do hope to, to look more into what the impact is for younger students versus high school students um, in future phases of the study. Mm -hmm. And I want to use something you just said as a jumping off point to go back to our educators about um, how identity can be defined so broadly through this lens of diversity. So Josie gave a great example about the student with alopecia. Um, are there other examples uh, from the panel about students who have maybe different abilities or if you're talking about different types of identity or diversity where you've been able to uh, feel like you've made an impact in that space. Um, Hwanya, maybe we can go back to you first. Um, yes, I would say the book, um, Who the F Are You? I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It's a graphic novel, and the main character wears a hijab. And mm -hmm. so that was, big, that was, I had a student that was very impressed by the book and having that book and seeing herself, you know, character, a main character in that. So that has been um, a popular book um, um, that I've I've had. Um, I'm trying to think of other titles right now. Um, I don't know, The Poet X. Uh, we Will Make It, I believe that's the title. It's a narrative um, text, another young lady that was another Hispanic student. So that was able to make great connections with that particular book. So there have been a few that I know that kids um, are kind of like, oh, and, you know, the same that they didn't have those characters, but then here comes Ms. Urquhart with, you know, the perfect book, like here, I, I have you. So I'm here for you. I have it. Here you go. So, yeah. I like what you said too about them being the main character and them not, you know, that that not, that not, core yeah. representation merit matters yeah. so much. So exactly. I think there's a lot of yeah. a lot about that. Um can you do can you say the title of the uh, book about the hijabi student one more time? Is Who the F are you? And that gets the kids because they're like, What are you saying right now? But and then <laughs> Gotta have well, a little shock value for your middle school students. Right. It's not only that, but it's also a graphic novel. And I know the the second book in the series is going to be published, I believe, next month. And it's Who the F Cares. So it's her okay. first name, Huda. H U D A. Yeah. Huda. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, George Marie, can we go back to you on the elements, other elements of identity that you've noticed? You talked a lot about um, okay. language. <laughs> Um, have there been other elements of students' identities that you've seen really shine or resonate through the books that you've offered? Yeah, there. Um, since we're mentioning books, there are two books in particular that uh, make me think about uh, self-image, body positivity, and um, I have some students in my class that you know are feeling self-conscious about that. And two books that have helped. One is "I Am Enough" by Grace Byers. And it's just, it's just such a beautiful book. Everything about it just gives me such joy. And I find that um, I have two students in particular who like to look at that book a lot. And there's another book, it's newer, and it's by Vashti Harrison called Big. And um, I, I think that's another book that has helped, uh, you know, several of my students, not only girls, but also boys. And, and you know, in self-image, body positivity, their confidence about how they carry themselves. So I think that that's an important thing to have in the classroom as well. Wonderful. Um, and Josie, what about you, especially maybe from a social emotional learning lens? Have there been um, certain topics or titles or uh, some of those soft skills qualities that you've seen your students really be able to grow in through having more access to these titles? 
Yeah. So I think one thing that I do is when we come in from after lunch, it's always really crazy. And so we meditate every day. Um, and so I usually read a meditation, you know, we use like different chimes and stuff, but we also have like a peace area, which is very Montessori. And so I have peace books or meditation books. And so if students are upset for doing things like that, you know, I usually make a suggestion. Oh, would you like to go to the peace area and read a peace book? I can think like, do you want to read the ones on alpha like it's alpha gator alligator breaths or something like that it's alpha breaths because it goes through the abcs but so pretty much all the books in that section have come from first book um through the mindfulness um section and kind of the sel stuff and so sometimes i even saw some of my students um they were like because we do kind of a work cycle you know they give them more freedom and they were one of them was leading a meditation and so there were two other kids beside them and they were like breathe in Oh, wow. and so they were leading their own meditation because we did it during class, but then they wanted to do it as like a calm down strategy. So I think that really shows kind of the impact of um, them using the skills and using the books. That's fantastic. Um, so I thank you all so much. I want to just end with one note for some of the questions in the chat have been asking, how do other educators get to be involved in the study and how were they chosen? So we are doing tons of research through First Book Research and Insights, uh, Jules's fantastic work all throughout the year. And we are sending usually emails to members of our network to invite you to be involved in different opportunities you might be interested in. So please keep an eye on your email. Um, and if there's something that is applicable to you where we need your voice uh, to be like one of our fantastic panelist members here today or to add your experience to one of our studies like this, we will reach out. Um, you can also reach out to First Book Member Services at any time if you have questions um, at help at firstbook.org. But I want to wrap it up for tonight and um, leave you all with a parting gift, which is a code to the First Book Marketplace, not just for our panelists, of course, you guys are welcome to use this too. Um, but for anyone in attendance, um, the code is DBIS25. And I apologize, I don't have a slide for it, um, but we will email you all that code as well so that you can see it. So DBIS as in Diverse Books Impact Study 25. And that will be for 25% off of any book on the first book marketplace because um, this representation and diversity and inclusion is so important to us. You'll find these fantastic titles all over every section of our site. Um, so DBIS25 for 25% off. I promise we will email it to you too. Um, but I wanna thank everyone again, all our panelists and Jules and Dan for a fantastic discussion this evening. And we appreciate your being here and your time. And we will keep you posted as we have more studies and more uh, resource opportunities available in the future. So thank you so much.